type of census or or uh, or conscription page that looks like this. These are also all online at the archive of the uh, the city archive in Prague, and this has again the whole family listed. It's Joseph Gabriel Nachod. The interesting thing about this is it notes that the family moved in 1869 to Vienna. So this this has confirmation of when the family moved to Vienna. Uh, Prague marriages are indexed on Jewish gens, so you can find them there. Joseph Nachod, he married in 1845 to Carolina Jontov Futter. And here's what one of the versions of that marriage record looks like. Uh, Joseph, the son of Gabriel Nachod, he's 32 years old, and he married Carolina, the daughter of the Hiesigen Familianten, Jacob Isaac Jontov. That means that the Weiss family is also resident, officially resident in Prague, and they were familians. We'll talk about that. And the wedding took place in the Alt Neuschule. Uh, here's another version of the same marriage. Uh, it again lists the, also the uh, officiant, who's Solomon Rappaport, a famous rabbi um, in Prague. So I mentioned familianten. So the the Czechs had a system starting in the early 1700s of uh, limiting the number of Jewish families in all of Bohemia and Moravia. So there was a quota on the number of Jewish families in Prague and in the rest of Bohemia and in Moravia. And to keep track of those families, they gave each family a number, which was called a familianten number, a family number. And you could only only one person only one family could have that number at any one time so in order for someone to get married they had to usually wait for the father to die or they had to purchase uh a a number from someone who didn't have sons uh and but because of this horrible system uh which was very anti-semitic obviously we have very good records for the jews in prague uh, and these are some of the best records that we have so these familiar records will list the whole family. And here you see the familiaten record for Gabriel Nachod. And it says his parents are Avigdor and Pessel. Uh, and he married Ava, the daughter of Moses Tzodex in 1801. And uh, then it also lists his son, Joseph. Now, Joseph was not the first son. So why is he uh, the one that got married? Well, Simon, the first son, uh, died uh, at a young age when he was a boy. And then there was a, a second son, Philip. And it says in this uh, record that Philip it was uh, was baptized in Vienna in 1831. And this coincides with the family story in my family that my grandfather's sister uh, told that uh, Joseph, our ancestor, had an older brother who went to Vienna and studied and, uh, and was baptized. And as a result, my great-grandfather Joseph, or my great-great-grandfather Joseph, was not allowed to study. He wanted to, to go and be educated, but wasn't allowed by his family to study, um, and uh, because the older brother was baptized. Uh, that older brother actually got a medical degree in Vienna and then ended up in Hungary, and I'm in touch with his descendants. So here is uh, the birth now of Joseph Nahud. Uh, the interesting thing here is that in this, the the Christian copies of the records in the index, he's called Joseph Gabriel Nahud. But in the actual record, they call him Gabriel, uh, Joseph Gabriel Tachau. So they made a mistake in this record and gave him the wrong, the wrong uh, last name. But uh, in, the, he, in the original that was kept by the Jewish community, which is very hard to read, uh, it does say Nachod. So you can see why someone might have misread it at some point. Um, but it's, it's the sort of middle entry there where it says Joseph um, and it lists his parents and the... Uh, the witnesses to the wedding. Okay, so now we're on to Gabriel Nachod, and this is a man who was born around 1776 and died 1849 in Prague. Uh, his grave would have been in the, what I sort of consider the middle cemetery of Prague. So there's the very famous old cemetery in Prague, which everybody visits and knows. And then there's a new cemetery that has Kafka's grave, for example. And then there's the one in between, which covered most of the 19th century. And unfortunately, that cemetery was uh, partially destroyed in the 1980s. So just before the communist system ended, they destroyed the half of the Jewish cemetery and built a giant radio tower. Uh, 
which you can see a picture of there. So many of the graves are not there, and uh, and we have not found Gabriel's grave in the remaining graves. Now it could be because it was under the radio tower, or it also could be because, it, as this um, index indicates, uh, it says Brett uh, at the end of it, which means it could have been made out of wood, uh, possibly, or we're not quite sure exactly what that what that means. The experts uh, in in Prague aren't hundred percent sure, but in any case, the the grave no longer exists. But we do have the grave register that lists uh, Gabriel, and here it lists his father as a Vigdor. A Vigdor was his father. Um, this is like a coroner's report that they have in the state archives in Prague uh, for deaths around that time when he died in eighteen forty nine. So it's it's what the the coroner or doctor recorded his death, the time of death, uh, and, and who the people were. So Dr. Karpel, I think, is the one who did this in 1849. Um, there's a death record book in Prague. So it says he was 74 years old when he died in 1849, and that he left behind two sons and three daughters. Um, here's another version of the death record. Uh, OK. And uh, here, here we have actually a picture of the street he lived on. There's actually sort of an address book for the Jews in, in Prague in the early 1800s. And, uh, and there's also photos of some of those streets. So I've put this together. This is, this is the street he lived on. The ghetto was um, largely destroyed. So if you go to, the, to Prague today and you see what was the Jewish ghetto, it's really been um, sort of reconstructed. In other words, the whole streets of houses were taken out to make broad streets that you could drive cars through. Uh, so it was cleaned up in the in the latter part of the first half of the 1800s and uh, and does not look the same as it used to be. It used to be very crowded in the old Jewish ghetto in Prague. Um, so here is Gabriel's marriage uh, recorded. So here it says Gabriel, remember in, in one of the records it says his father was a Vigdor. Well here the name is Dan. So Gabriel Dan Nachud getting married at age 24 to Eva uh, Tzodex. And here's the Jewish version of that. And here you can see uh, a little bit of beginning of Hebrew in the record. So on the right it has the witnesses, um, some of them signing in Hebrew. Uh, there is a, as I mentioned, you had to get permission to be married because still the familiaten system was in place until 1848. And so there, there are various index books that record the marriage permissions. Here's one that, for Gabriel Nachod in 1801. And here again is that familiaten record that we've seen before that lists Gabriel uh, and his parents here, as I mentioned, are Evigdor and Pessel. Uh, there's a, another version of the Fimbyan books here, this one. Uh, so it's the same type of information. It has him and his uh, father. And this one is a Vigdor or Dan. Uh, and it also lists the children. And it, it uh, has an indication here of a, um, a, a fund that he left behind when he died uh, to support the synagogue. And I found the records for that. You, I asked the state archives, and they still have records of these, of these funds. So he he left behind some money, and that was for um, support of the Alt Neuschule when he died. Uh, so there's a famous famous census that we use in researching in Prague in 1794. Uh, there's one in 1794, and also another one in 1792. In the rest of Bohemia, there's a census for 1793, and this is invaluable for genealogists because of course it, it to have a list of, of entire families from before 1800 is amazing. Uh, unfortunately for me, in this case, Gabriel Nachod was just a single man living alone. His parents had already died. So there's not a lot of information. Uh, it does though say that he was a Schulzinger. He was a, a cantor uh, on, this, on this record, which matches some of the others. Uh, Amazingly for Gabriel Nachod, there was a descendant of his who published in 1905 a, a poem he wrote. Um, it's sort of a poetic version of the creation of the world, of Genesis, the beginning of the Bible, uh, the song of the, of the creation of the world, um, all in rhyme. And, uh, and it's amazing to have something like this for my ancestor who, who died, uh, as we saw, in 1849. 
but he was um, apparently, we, I didn't note this on the, when we went through the records, he was some type of wedding planner or someone who um, introduced people for weddings, uh, probably had something to do with, with uh, performing at weddings since he was a singer. And so here's, here's this poem of his. Okay, so now I mentioned that Gabriel's father was either Daniel or Avigdor Nachut. So let's look at Daniel or Avigdor, who was born in 1722 in Prague and dies in 1792. Um, here's his death record. So we know when he died, and there it's listed as Daniel Nachud, age 70. Uh, there's a grave register. This is again for that uh, that cemetery that was largely destroyed, and we've not discovered his his uh, his grave. Uh, on this grave register, it makes a note. It says a Vigdor, uh, so not Dan, but a Vigdor, the son of Moshe, and it says Sigal, which would mean that he was a Levite, but that is incorrect, uh, and I'm not sure why that is there. But anyway, the date matches uh, the record that we saw for Dan Nachod previously. So here it says Daniel, and here it says a Vigdor, but the date is the same. Uh, and here now we get to some of the familiant records. So here it shows a Vigdor Nachod was his Hebrew name and Dan was the German name that Jews were required after the tolerance patent of Joseph II in the 1780s to uh, abandon their Jewish names and adopt names that were German. And so a Vigdor became Dan Nachod. Um, and this has his, his uh, children, Moses and Gabriel listed there. Uh, here's another listing of Nahud, a Victor Nahud. So there weren't a lot of Avigdors. Um, so in Prague, in uh, beginning in 1748, uh, after the Jews who were expelled from Prague for three years uh, were able to return, they kept they started keeping records. Uh, they called them Fasionen. I'm not sure why. Um, and there, each family has one of these pages beginning in 1748. And so when someone got married, they would, they would start up a new page like this. So this is a page from 1760 when a Vigdor, here it's spelled E-W-I-G-D-O-E-R, a Vigdor, Moses, Nachod, and here Nachod is spelled with a T at the end, uh, but spelling often doesn't matter in these records there. It's very flexible. Uh, but this records his marriage to Pessel, uh, the daughter of Joseph Bunzel. And um, so we have this information. Uh, there is an index for these marriage permissions. Uh, and so here he is, Nacho de Victor and Pessel Bunzel, February 28th, 1760. And if you really dig, and I have, in the state archives in Prague, they have um, boxes full of documents from what they call the Jewish Commission. And in those are the marriage permission. Uh, so in other words, there was a formal office where you had to apply for a marriage license. And then every week or two, they would approve marriages. And there, there's a uh, usually three, four, five page document that lists all of the marriages that are being approved at that time. And so here's the one for Avigdor, the son of Moses, Nahud, uh, and, uh, and Pessel, his wife, Pessel the daughter of the deceased Joseph Bunzel. Uh, and it shows the taxes that they were required to pay for the marriage license. So again, this is from 1760 in the Czech State Archives. Uh, not easy to find, but it is findable if you're doing research in this area. Okay, now we're back. Uh, Victor's father we saw was Moses from his marriage, right? So let's look at Moses Nachud. This is now a man, again, born in around before 1697. We'll show you why I know that and dies 1759 in Prague. So there is uh, very famously the old cemetery of Prague and there've been a number of attempts to index this. Uh, Nancy High, who's on the on the talk listening today, who uh, we've never met. I don't even think I had seen her before she pop popped in, but we communicate almost every day because she's been helping me uh, from, from Boston read through uh, these indexes of the graves of the old cemetery and uh, and doing an amazing job. Without her, I wouldn't be able to do a lot of this work. So I wanted to give her a shout out. Uh, anyway, this is uh, an index. The top one is done by, by Leopold Popper, uh, which talks about Moshe, the son of Bennett Nahud. And, uh, and then there's also 
a, uh, a text from his gravestone that Popper did. Popper died in 1885, uh, and his work was, I think they say it's not finished, but it, he did he did a relatively complete index of the of the cemetery in Prague, the old cemetery in Prague. Uh, and here's a transcription by one of their successors, Otto Munales, who also tried to do before he died a uh, an index of the old cemetery in Prague. Uh, he was the famously the director of the Jewish Museum after World War II. And so here again is, is a description of the text from Moses, the son of Bennett Nachod. And here is the actual grave itself uh, that I visited in 2019 with Daniel Polakovich, who's working yet on yet another index of the old cemetery in Prague. So many people have started to do indexes. Uh, no one's ever finished one completely, but we're hoping to get that uh, eventually from Daniel Polakovich. And uh, so here's his grave in that old cemetery. Now, Moses Nachod um, was uh, alive, of course, in 1754 when there was a, a large fire that burned down a lot of the ghetto. And so in the records of uh, claimed losses from the fire in 1754, he is listed there. Uh, it's about a third of the way down. He claimed 800 uh, whatever the whatever the uh, the unit of measure was there, um, and this is uh, mentioned in 1748 is when we begin to see these fasion and uh, and so this is the one for Moses Nachod. Uh, it looks like he's selling tobacco at that time, and uh, and it has his wife uh, at the time Hindel and the sons Simcha and Evigdor. Evigdor, there's Evigdor that we saw earlier. Uh, and it even says the street that they lived on. If you go back further in 1729, here you see me with the census, the Jewish census of 1729, uh, which is again, an amazing resource that we have for Prague. It's this giant book, they let me hold it and uh, all the families are listed with all of their the wives and kids. And so in 1729, Moses Bennett Nachod is listed with his wife Hindala and their son Simcha and Figdor, F-I-G-D-O-R, which is of course a Vigdor. Now I mentioned that we know when uh, that Moshe was alive, at least in 1697. That is because the Jewish Museum of Prague has this amazing Torah curtain donated by his grandparents, uh, Manas, the son of Shalom Nachod, and his wife Frumadal, the daughter of Joseph Aush. Uh, in honor of their grandson Moshe in 1697. So we're super lucky to have, this is almost like a, a birth record. It may have been done uh, after his birth or possibly after his apshirn at three years old. Uh, traditionally, the children would get the first haircut and so it could have been done that time. So he's born around 1697, maybe a few years earlier. And this Torah curtain, of course, proves that. Uh, this is the, actually before restoration, what it looked like. Okay, so who is Bennett Nahud, Moses' father? Um, I'm going to have to go a little faster as we go through these. So Bennett Nahud, here again in the Old Cemetery Index by Popper, uh, it's just his grave. Uh, and here is the transcription of his grave. He died in 1742. And here's the grave itself, uh, which is still intact in the Old Cemetery in Prague. Uh, he's on a house list from 1727 that we have in Prague. Uh, it's, he's the fourth one down, 137 Bennett Nachod. Uh, he's also, of course, in that 1729 census. Uh, and uh, with his one unmarried son, Manas, his other son uh, was already born. Moshe was already born. Uh, now we get to some new records. In the Prague Municipal Archive, they have... Uh, tr books that they call Liber Judeorum Albus, which are giant books that recorded all sorts of transactions involving Jews. Usually it's mortgage transactions, loans, and things like that. These were all recorded in these enormous books. Uh, and this is a mortgage transaction between Wolf Schulhoff and Bennett Nachod in 1724 concerning the house that Bennett inherited from his, his deceased father, Manas Nachod. Uh, so these are written in German at this time. Some of the early records are written in Czech. Uh, it looks like Bennett Nachod in 1695 visited the Leipzig Fair. We have uh, records from that also. Um, that could be where he picked up the cloth that was used uh, a couple of years later 
for that Torah curtain. It was very common for the textile merchants who went up and traded at the Leipzig Fair to bring it down, down to Prague to sell, and whatever was left over they would use for curtains and dedicate those in the synagogues in, in Prague. Uh, Bennett Nachod is also mentioned in a book by uh, Rabbi Meyer Perlis called Megillat Sefer, um, where, uh, because apparently the two of them went to Vienna and were trapped in a snowstorm uh, on Purim in 1709 outside, in Neustorf outside of Vienna, and uh, Meyer Perlis recorded that. So who knows why he was traveling, but he must have been uh, a relatively wealthy merchant in Prague who traveled all over the place. Um, here's another one of these pages from the Liber uh, Judeorum Albus, which is uh, a confirmation that uh, that Bennett is the son of Frumadal and Manus Nachod, um, and not Frumadal's first husband or an earlier wife of Manus, because it says here that that Bennett is the son of of these two. Uh, so that's it's nice to have that confirmation since both of them were uh, at least that his mother was married once before. Uh, so here is the the mother. Now we're going to follow the mother of Bennett Nachod is Frumadal. Nachod, uh, and she's the daughter of, of Joseph Ausch. Um, here's, here's her grave again. So we're gonna go quickly through those. The grave is sort of hidden, piled up here. She's the daughter of the Rosh Medina, the head of the land. He is a, a, we're not quite sure why he's so important, but he was the first signatory on the first statutes of the, uh, the country Jews, the Landesjudenschaft outside of uh, Prague and the rest of Bohemia. And, uh, and she's the wife of, of Manis Nachod. So here's the grave of her husband, Manis Nachod. Uh, and we have lots of information on that. There's yet another Torah curtain that mentions Frumadal uh, in the Jewish Museum. Uh, we have for the Pincus Synagogue, which is another one of the famous synagogues in Prague. It's the one that now has all the names of the victims of the Shoah on the walls. Um, that that uh, that Frumadal was a was a an official of the Pincus Synagogue Gabayot, so they have the appointment book in the Jewish Museum in Prague. Uh, here's another note about Frumadal's house. Uh, and, and I titled this talk "An Embarrassment of Riches." Right, we're talking about uh, records now before 1700, and we have a number of them. This is the uh, part the tax records for. From Middle's husband, Manus Nachod. So it, every time he had a transaction that required the payment of tax, it was recorded in these books. So we know in 1685 and 1695 the type of taxes he was paying. Uh, and then there are various pages from the seat book of the Pincus Synagogue that talks about how he got his seat book, his seat in the synagogue from his father in law, uh, from Frumadal's father. Um, yeah. Amazing. Okay, so we're going to follow up from Frumadal to her mother, Yentl, the, the uh, wife of Joseph Ausch, and uh, she is the daughter of Chaim ben Heschel Halfon. So let me go through quickly of this. She's buried in the old cemetery, so we have the, her grave. It's also printed in a book by, uh, by Simon Hawk, who's another person who tried to index all the graves in the old cemetery. Uh, and here is her beautiful grave. Uh, and it says she's the daughter of Chaim ben Heschel's from Vienna, and also the wife of that Joseph Ausch, the Rosh Medina. So Chaim Heschel will go back. Now we're going back to Vienna. So in, you know probably that in 1670, the Jews were expelled from Vienna, and a lot of them then went to Prague. And so this is a family where that happened. Chaim, uh, her father had died already in Vienna in 1648. So there's his grave in Vienna. Um, Chaim's wife, however, had died in Prague, Kressel, uh, and she is the daughter of uh, Betzal ben Chaim ben Sinai, who is the brother of the Maharal, so she's from, from that family. Um, and I'm going to go quickly now. Chaim, uh, who is the, the son of Heschel Halfon, so Heschel Halfon, we don't have a grave for him, but um, Bernhard Bachstein was convinced he knew who he was because he found him in this property book from 1632 in Vienna that lists all of the, the Jewish homes in Vienna in 1632. And here's Heschel, uh, the son of Elias, the Jewish doctor. Uh, and there's the page from that. He had a brother whose grave is there. And here's Rabbi Elias 
Alfon, who's from Prague and moved to Vienna and died there in 1624. Here's his grave in Vienna. Uh, just a fragment is left. And we know that he moved to Vienna from Prague in 1598 because there's a book. Uh, it's actually in a German archive of Rudolf II, the, Ke the Kaiser at that time who lived in Prague, who gave him permission uh, as a doctor to move to Vienna. So he gave him permission. Here's the permission page um, giving my ancestor, uh, Dr. Elia Halfon, the permission to move to Vienna in 1598. Now, Elia, uh, we know from his grave in Vienna that his father was Dr. Abba Marie Halfon. And here he is in the Popper Index, and here's his grave in the old cemetery in Prague. So, uh, Abba Marie Halfon died around 1585, and uh, and his father, as listed on his grave, is uh, Dr. Uh, Eliahu Menachem Halfon of Venice. So he's in a bunch of famous books and listed because he. And I'll close this out. Uh, he's even in the Jewish Encyclopedia, has a lot of claims to fame. He was a rabbi and doctor. Uh, he wrote an opinion for Henry VIII uh, about his divorce. He was involved with Shlomo Molcho, the uh, uh, alleged false messiah, and had various disputes. Uh, and uh, here's the evidence of that. Okay, so I'm going to finish up with this. It's It's been a long time. Uh, and go over now to another slideshow, if that's okay and talk a little bit about the film I've made, Tracing My Family Back Through Prague. So you can see, you know, we've, we've traced back now 500 years using records in Prague. That's not possible in most other, uh, most other locations to trace Jews that far. There may be only a few other places where you can do that. Frankfurt is one, uh, maybe Amsterdam also. But unless you're lucky enough to have family from these large cities, it's really almost impossible to trace back that far. Uh, and I was in visiting. I have cousins in Italy. I have a cousin in Venice, and I was visiting her and, and telling her that I traced our family back through Prague and Vienna and back to Prague and all the way to Venice, where she lives. And she said, oh, that would make an interesting documentary. Why don't we, why don't we do that? Uh, and so I, by, by coincidence, I went back to, um, back to Los Angeles and ran into some people who, uh, who were documentary filmmakers. And uh, if I can find it now, I'm going to try to um, show you show you some of the slides from the film that we just made um, in uh, by in 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 all of these locations. Okay, so let me show that now. Hopefully, this isn't too boring. Um, and it seems to be in reverse order, so I'm going to try to go down to here and play from start. And I have to share. Sorry about that. And that is the end of it. Let me, uh, it's going the wrong direction. That's very interesting. I'm going to, sorry about this. I'm going to have to zoom through this and then go back the right direction. I'm not sure why it's in reverse order. Uh, thought I had set it up correctly. Okay, so you're gonna, we're going to run through these and then I'm going to take questions. Oh my goodness. You're getting a preview before I show you everything. Why is it in reverse order? Who knows? Almost there. Okay. A lot of slides. Let's see if we get through them all. Oh, it did it, it again. Okay, I'm gonna have to re redo this. I'm sorry. Uh, I have no idea why it's in the wrong order. Well, this is really not going to work. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I know how to do it. One moment. Sorry, I thought I was ready, but I wasn't. It's, it, uh, everything is okay. We are all at home, you, sitting very comfortable. If you could, if you could sit sit tight for one second, I'm going to uh, adjust the settings on this, and then that will. Uh, let's see. Home and our slideshow. Well, set up slideshow, there it is. Loop continuously. That will now work, I believe, if I play it. Okay, there we go. Now I'm gonna share screen. Sorry about that. 
no idea why it's backwards, but anyway, here it is. Okay, so um, I went to Vienna with the filmmaker, and uh, this is not the filmmaker, and met a lot of the people uh, on a scouting trip in January, and then we went back in April and May and did the film. So here is uh, my friend, Wolf Eric Eckstein, who is probably the best genealogist in Vienna right now. Uh, if, you're, if you're doing research in Vienna, you want to talk to him and hire him. And here we are at the St. Karlfriedhof uh, about to look for graves. So here's that grave of Joseph Nachod that we saw. And this is in the first gate of the, uh, of the Central Cemetery in Vienna and some random pictures. Here's that grave of my grandfather, Arnold Schoenberg, who's an honorary grave. So he's in a, a different gate, different part of the cemetery. Um, and then we went to the fourth gate, and over at the fourth gate, I found that grave of Dr. Elia Halfon that's a fragment. This was a, a grave that used to be in a different cemetery, which I'll show you in Vienna, in the Seigasse. And during World War II, it's believed that the Jewish community buried the graves. Uh, some of them were buried in the, under the ground in the Seigasse. Others were brought over to the Zentralfriedhof, and these were uncovered just in the last 10 years ago in the fourth gate, which is sort of the new active cemetery, Jewish cemetery in Vienna. Um, they discovered in this field all of these uh, all of these old gravestones, including that that one from 16, I think it's 1632, from Dr. Elia Halfon, the one who had moved from Prague to Vienna with permission from Rudolf II. So here's Wolferich finding that grave fragment uh, and his technique of using chalk to read it. Uh, Okay, so then we went from there to the Weringer Friedhof, which is the middle cemetery in Vienna, like the one I was talking about in, in Prague. So this is the one that covers the 19th century before they opened up the central cemetery. And that one has been largely um, restored over the last decade or so. It used to be a jungle uh, as the central cemetery was. And uh, Wolferich went there and we looked for some graves. Um, I visited a number of my friends. This is Barbara Kintert, who lives near the Zegasa Cemetery and is the one who introduced me to that first. She has done little uh, memorials for the Jews on her street in that area of Vienna. And here's one listing all the people in that house who were uh, in, in that street who had been deported and murdered by the Nazis. Uh, she also has this other memorial here, which has all of the people on the entire street. Um, and they're all represented by keys and their names. Uh, and standing with Barbara there is Matthew Mashori, who's the director of the film. So here we are walking to the, the old, old cemetery in the Zegasse. It's inside an old age home. So there's an old age home you have to walk inside. And in the courtyard in the back is this old cemetery here. Uh, and these are graves that are um, from the 1500s up to the 1700s, basically, uh, before the Vering Friedhof opened in Vienna. Um, so it's very, very old graves, very large ones, and they're in the process of, of uh, digging them up and putting them back in order. Some of them are still in fragments here, so it gives you an idea. Uh, Barbara showed us some of the some of the other memorial projects going on in Vienna. This is one in a in a subway that shows where people were deported to from Vienna, and this is the new Holocaust Memorial in Vienna that was just opened last year. It lists all of the Jewish victims from, from Vienna, including uh, my Seisel family that I mentioned at the beginning, Sigmund Seisel from 1871. Also a lot of Schoenbergs, my grandfather's brother, his cousin, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, lots of cakes in Vienna. I always include those in my slides because they're, they're when I post them on Facebook, they're the most popular posts uh, that you could possibly do. So this is uh, Ger my good friend, Georg Gaugusch. Georg is, along with Volk Volferic Eckstein, sort of the best genealogist that you could ever find. Uh, and uh, Georg may be the best in the world, not just the best in Vienna. He's the one that's been publishing these enormous volumes on all of the Jewish upper, upper class or upper middle class Jewish families in Vienna, the haute bourgeoisie. Uh, and he, he owns a, a shop in Vienna uh, this is his home, and uh, uh, in in the shop he discovered uh, all of these old books with all their old customers and all the Jewish families. So that's how he got interested as a as a teenager in these families. And now he's the world's expert on all the sort of fancy Jews in Vienna. Uh, 
Here's uh, Johannes Fleischmann, a violinist who appeared in our film and played music by my grandfather. He took me to the house. I hadn't actually ever been inside uh, near where he works, is the birthplace of my grandfather, Arnold Schoenberg. It's, it's sort of a fancy house. And our thinking is, since they had no money, he, they probably rented a room uh, in the basement. And that's where my grandfather was born because they moved around quite a lot. And this is the only house that's still left, but they certainly weren't um, uh, fancy enough to live in the upper apartments. Here's the woman who owns the building um, showing us. Here's the uh, another Holocaust memorial in Vienna on the Judenplatz. Uh, and then we went to the Austrian National Library to do research there. And there, uh, you can see they, they were a little bit uh, restrictive on what I could do, but I hear they, they're giving me the book to carry in to this beautiful hall um, and reading room. And the book is a book that was owned by the Halfon family. So the, the, it may have been brought to Vienna by that Dr. Elia Halfon, or it may have been bought in, in Italy, but it's definitely owned by his, his um, grandparents and great grandfather. And it's, it has Kabbalistic charts like this in it. Uh, in, in the crossed out portion of the top of this slide, it actually says um, this Questo Libro, like this book belongs to Elia Halfon. So that's the grandfather probably of um, the Elia Halfon who went to, to Vienna or it may have been him himself, we're not quite sure. Uh, you can see the nice mem that's written in there. Uh, the book has articles by Maimonides and articles on astronomy and astrology. It's really an amazing thing. So this, this is an old book that belonged to my family. Uh, we visited Shmuel Shapira, who's a hat maker in Vienna on the Maria Hilferstrasse. He's the one that's restoring the old cemetery in the Zegasse. He didn't want me to take his picture but I secretly took his picture so you could see him. He refused to be in the documentary because he's apparently too, too religious for that. But, uh, but he's been doing a lot of great work in the cemetery in Vienna, in the old, old cemetery. Uh, this is Matthew Mishori and marie Therese Arnbon, who writes lots of books on the Jew Jewish families um, in Austria, in various towns around Salzburg and in Vienna. She's now the head of the theater museum. Uh, she has Jewish background also from Bohemia. Uh, I think Vinternitz is her family. Uh, and she's the wife of Georg Algush. Uh, this is Georg Storr, Jungmann and Neffe, which is right across from the opera. Uh, it's an old haberdashery, so it has old old uh, clothing and, and things. And here, here I am in the Schoenberg Center. My grandfather's archives are also in Vienna, and we have little uh, apartments there next to the Schoenberg Center. So there's a big picture of him. So here's uh, Teresa Muxenader, the archivist of the Schoenberg Center, and Matthew Mishori, the director in the exhibit in the Schoenberg Center. Uh, here's the archives of the Schoenberg Center, where I found a lot of information, obviously, about my grandfather and his family. So here's Teresa showing us those. Uh, when you're in Vienna, in the uh, what's called the gasometer, or gasometer is a it's an old gas storage facility that they've turned into uh, apartments and sh shops and also the archive of the city of Vienna. So the archive of the city of Vienna is in that building, looks like this, and you can go there and find all those old Viennese records. Uh, that's that book from 1632, which has the sort of property register of the Jew Jewish town in Vienna in 1632. Uh, they also had this nice map so you could see where they lived. Uh, they, this is uh, one of the census records for the Nachods in, in Vienna. Um, and then they also have an index uh, of tax records in 1782 in, in this Vienna archive. So you never know where you're going to find things. Uh, this is the, the Zeitenstengasse synagogue in Vienna, uh, where my, on my mom's side, many of the family members were, were married there, my great great grandparents. Ah, more food and cakes. This is the, always the most important part of my trip. Uh, and now we're in Prague. Uh, this is uh, me with Lenka Matuskova. She is the, she was, she's retired now, the chief archivist uh, of the state archives in Prague and principally responsible for making all of the Jewish records available. So it's thanks to Lenka that we now have scans of all of these old Jewish books. Uh, and uh, there you can see the, the census of 1729. Uh, sitting on the table there, and all the other books that she was that she had prepared for us, so we could see all the records of my family. There's that 1729 census again. Um, remember, I mentioned that Joseph Ausch, and he this he signed this this uh, statutes of the 
the country Jews, the Landesjudenschaft in 1659. This is the actual statutes, and he's the first signature there, uh, Joseph, Joseph Ausch. Uh, and here's Lenka again. Uh, this is Ivana Ebelova. She is uh, the person who works, she's a professor at the university, and she has spearheaded the efforts to um, index all of the censuses that they have in, in Prague, including that 1794 census, 1792 census, and the 1793 Bohemian census. So she's published all of these, uh, and it's very important for us genealogically. Again, more cake, right? Because you have to have cake. Uh, and here I am with Julius Muller, who is the best gene Jewish genealogist in the Czech Republic, uh, and Aneta, who is one of our producers. Um, Julius is the one that showed us all around Prague and, and elsewhere. Um, so he brought us then to the, uh, the archives in, uh, these are the municipal archives, I believe, uh, and looks like this, where we saw records about um, the Yonta Futters, for example. Um, this is this um, Liber Judeorum Albus again. So these are these old, old records. Uh, this is a record actually in this time in Czech. So this is before 1600. I think it's 15, what do I see? Oh, this one, yeah, 1591, something like that. So at, the at that time, the records are written in Czech. So this is about Elias, uh, the Dr. Elias Halfon. It says Rabbi Elias Doctor. You can see it a little bit there. Uh, a little binding there. Here's the archivist bringing it out to us. You see how big these books were. So, you know, these books are, are, are 300 and 400 years old from the 1500s. Now, here I am uh, going into the Jewish Museum archives uh, with Thomas Krakora and Daniel Polakovich. There's Daniel Polakovich showing me one of those seat books from the Pincus Synagogue. Uh, the storage facility that they have there is actually an old synagogue. So here's the Aron HaKodesh and it's with all of these boxes around it. So they've, they've turned an old synagogue into an archive. Uh, and this is where the Jewish Museum has its archives in Prague. That's Thomas Krakora, the archivist. Uh, okay, so here we are now in the, one of the cemeteries. Uh, this is the the one near the radio tower. There's Matthew in front of the radio tower. Uh, and this is at the new cemetery, the one with Kafka. They have a ceremony hall. And I have a cousin who works there. Peter Velheim is a volunteer there. And so he was showing that. And there he is. He's, he's my cousin. And he's already planned uh, ahead on his family grave. He's already had his own name and birth inscribed. So all they have to do is fill in the death. But he's a wonderful man who I met through my genealogical research and and uh, has really uh, connected a lot recently with his Jewish roots and works, as I said, as a volunteer at the at the uh, new new cemetery. Uh, this is Dr. Alexander Putik, who's the principal uh, uh, scientist historian for the Jewish Museum of Prague. He's showing us the one of the streets that the Nachwitz lived on outside the Pincus Synagogue. Uh, this is the Pincus Synagogue where those Torah curtains were once hung. And now, as I mentioned, it's the place where they have a memorial to all the murdered Jews from the Czech Republic. Uh, and so here's, for example, a page of that. Uh, this is now in the old cemetery outside of that. Uh, here's Daniel Polakovich now showing me that very old grave from 1585 of Abba Marie Halfon. Uh, so these are familiar, these are the Nachvod graves. Uh, in one of the other synagogues, in the Meisel Synagogue, they have a, an amazing video of a, a model of the old ghetto in Prague from the early 1800s. And so you, so you can sort of zoom through and see what the, what the streets were like back then. It's, a, it's, it's very nice. Uh, this is the Alt Neuschul. And here's, uh, here we are with uh, Milan Janko, who's in charge of textiles at the Jewish Museum, showing us uh, the Torah curtains, and then we went to, out to Theresienstadt. Uh, so here's Theresienstadt, and since we are talking for Beit Terezin, I'm sure you're all familiar with the recreations there. In the exhibit there, they have a concert program, and it shows that also my grandfather's music was performed in the ghetto in Theresienstadt. Uh, and then from Theresienstadt, we went to Ushtek, which is where the Aush family came from, that Joseph Aush, who was the Rosh Medina, 
he's buried here in Ushtek. It was a nice, uh, beautiful day after snow, and we met there Fred and his son Timo Fatal, who is a, uh, a historian who works on Jewish cemeteries in Bohemia and Moravia. Uh, he has an organization called Tamus, and I've hired him to take photographs and index and, and uh, uh, whole, all, whole cemeteries all throughout Bohemia. So he's done dozens and dozens of cemeteries uh, and documented those for us, for our community. And he's just a wonderful person. Um, and we also met there Ahab Heidler, who is uh, an actor who lives in North Bohemia in Liber Liberitz. And he, uh, and he on his own also goes out and transcribes uh, and photographs Jewish cemeteries all throughout Bohemia and Moravia. And he's, he's taught himself Hebrew well enough to read all the transcriptions and understand them. Uh, just a wonderful guy, Ahab Heidler. Uh, and here they are finding the, the grave then of the Rosh Madina, Yosef Aush, who we heard so much about. Here's the little chapel. They have an Ushtek. Uh, and of course, we stopped for food in uh, Litumerzice, which is outside of Treisienstadt. So if you go to Treisienstadt, you'll probably get some food in the square there also. Um, here I am back in Vienna, and we went back to Vienna, and I met with Johannes Reis. Johannes Reis is the head of the Jewish Museum in Eisenstadt in the Burgenland in Austria, and he is also a, a, a famous weightlifter. And this is his wife, Trauda Triebel, who is a, an expert genealogist who deals with Jews in, the, in Niederösterreich, um, sort of outside of Vienna, and also specialized in converted Jewish families or half-Jewish families. Uh, and in Eisenstadt, I really recommend everybody go to Eisenstadt. If you take a trip to Vienna, take a little side trip out to Eisenstadt. It's about an hour or so away. They have a beautiful, uh, very moving chapel there. Uh, a lot of Jews, when they were expelled from Vienna in 1670, went to Eisenstadt, including some members of my family named Austerlitz. Uh, and so we were visiting the old graves. Some of the earliest graves in Eisenstadt are from this Austerlitz family. And then I went on to a castle called Forchtenstein, which was also owned by the Esterhazys who owned Eisenstadt. And there they have the archives of the Esterhazys, which they're just starting to open up. So for people interested in the Jews of the Borgenland, uh, this is an amazing place. Uh, and here they are showing me some of the archives in, in Forchtenstein. It's an entire castle filled like this. I mean, this is, this is not a, 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 an extraordinary room. This is Imagine room after room after room in a castle that looks just like this, just packed with documents. Um, and then we went from there down to Venice. And here, here we are with my cousin Serena on the Lido in Venice. And we met a wonderful old man named Aldo Izzo, who is a, a survivor, Italian survivor, uh, who lives on the Lido there and gives uh, tours sometimes of the old cemetery in on the Lido in Venice. And so he took us into into the old cemetery and there we found the grave of my oldest ancestor that we have a grave for which is Fioretta and that's going to be the title of the film that we made it's called Fioretta um, and in the film uh, we have sort of a recreation of finding of finding the grave but I found it for the first time on this scouting trip uh, earlier this year in January with my cousin Serena. Then we went to Florence, Italy and uh, this is Professor Fabrizio Lelli who is an expert on the Jews of uh, southern Italy, of Apulia and Naples, but he lives in Florence, and he found uh, a, a manuscript that was done by my ancestor, Eli Rabbi Eliyahu Menachem Halfon, the one who wrote the opinion for Henry VIII. This is in the Medici Library in Florence, uh, and it's this Kabbalistic manuscript that records the, the teachings of Shlomo Molcho after he was executed and burned at the stake in 1632. Uh, so that was incredible to see something like this uh, from, sorry, in 1532. Did I say 1632? I meant 1532. So this is nearly a 500-year-old um, uh, parchment. And it has a letter on the back written by my ancestor. Here's a, us having, having some uh, food, of course, some more sweets. And then we went to, in Venice. We, were, we went, went uh, into the synagogue and then I met various people. Uh, this is Renata Segre, who has written a lot of books on the Jews of Venice and Italy. Um, and uh, or this is Renata Segre. That is, um, oh, now I'm forgetting her name, but another another very nice lady uh, who does research on, on the Jews of Venice. Uh, and then we started the filming. We, can, we went back in April and May. And so here, I'm going to run through this. It's already been an hour, so I'm going to run through these quickly. But here I am with my cousin Michaela, 
um, and Thomas Krakora. Uh, the first week, also my cousin Arnie came, and so we visited the textiles here. Uh, here I am with that cousin Peter Wilhelm, my cousin Arnie in the new cemetery, uh, visiting that grave. Here we are with Julius Miller again in the, uh, the cemetery with the radio tower. Uh, and then I got COVID. <laughs> Unfortunately, the filmmakers all came down with it and immediately gave it to me. I landed, had dinner with them, and the next morning they all came down with it. And we still filmed with the crew for a week until I came down with it also. Uh, and uh, anyway, so that delayed us a little bit. They filmed uh, Dr. Putik in the old cemetery. Uh, here's the, the filmmaker, Maciej Twardowski, who is the head of cinematography, and Matthew Mashori, who is the the director. Um, then we went to Vienna when I got better and met with Volferic. Here's my cousin Serena with Volferic in the cemetery in Vienna, my cousin Arnie. We tried to get back in the Olshan, in the, in the um, sorry, in the Bering Cemetery, but they wouldn't let us in for filming, so we filmed outside it. Uh, we went to the Zeitenstettengasse, we went back to the Seegasse. Here's Serena looking a little bit cold and not so happy to be in so many cemeteries. Uh, we went to the memorial, we went to Gera Gaugush's and filmed a whole scene, like a dinner party there. Uh, and then my son came. So my son, Joey, joined us. And then suddenly the film became not about me and my cousins on a roots trip, but me dragging my not so interested son, teenage son, on a roots trip. And without any acting, he, he could uh, be like this, not quite, not quite as interested as I was in the old documents. And here we are in the archives of the city of Vienna in that gasometer. Here we are in the old, um, that old Austrian National Library. Uh, here again, outside, I think, in Eisenstadt, uh, filming in Forstenstein, down in Florence, uh, with that old manuscript again, uh, with Aldo Izzo in the, in the cemetery. Of course, it rained on the one day that we, we were going to find Fioretta. Uh, and there we are with the grave Fioretta. So if you see the film, you'll 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 know. Uh, there's Serena. Now my cousin Serena is an artist, so she did paintings, imagined paintings of all of our ancestors, and we had a whole opening of her paintings. So here's Aldo with some of them. Uh, they're doing makeup. When you do a film, they do makeup. Oh, here we are back in Prague. So this is now with the with the uh, those old old books in Prague. Um, Joey Board, of course, as usual. Uh, I had a little bit of a family reunion with my cousins in Prague. Uh, so I still have quite a few cousins in Prague. I even met some new ones on this trip. We went out then to Ustek. This was, remember, all snowy the first time we went there. And now we're there in the in the sun with, with Achab Heidler and Fred and, and Timo Fatal. There's Achab again. He's great. Uh, here we are in the cemetery. We went to Theresienstadt. Joey doesn't look so happy. Uh, we went down to, um, this is in the Alt Neuschule, I think with Julius, there, Joey's getting happier. In the Pincus Synagogue and in the Old Cemetery with Daniel Polakovich. And uh, this was the last slide. This is uh, us after completing filming and walking back towards our hotel across the river from the old ghetto and uh, towards the castle in Prague. So thank you very much for that very long. I hope, I hope you all made it through. It was a little bit over an hour. And uh, uh, the, just to conclude it, uh, Prague, if you're lucky enough to get your family connected to one of these families in Prague, you really can do a lot of amazing genealogical research. And not just in Prague, outside of Prague, we also have very good resources. But especially for Prague, uh, it's really an amazing, amazing thing. I think really there's nowhere else where you would want to have your family from in terms of genealogy. Uh, it really is an embarrassment of riches. And so thank you all for, for listening today and, and listening to me talk about it. And I hope when the film comes out, it'll be distributed and you'll all be able to see what we made of this genealogical journey. Thank you so much, Tammy. Thank you very much, Randy. And um, there's some questions in the sure. chat um, that people ask. The first one was, um, let's see. Um, do you see it also? I see Shmuel Yerushalmi wrote, I'm not, not remaining till the end, but yeah. he has a question. It, uh, is it all or at least majority residents of Bohemia, Moravia uh, that have any Jewish origins? I'm not quite sure what that, what that means. Um, 
no, the Jews have Jewish origins, but not everybody has Jewish origins in, in the Czech Republic, if that was the question he was asking. But, uh, but maybe he's asking whether they have origins in Prague. And I think there are a lot of connections uh, to Prague from many Jewish families outside in Bohemia and Moravia. Uh, and you see a lot of movement sometimes um, in the record. So also to the other big cities like uh, Mikulov in, in, or Nikolsburg in, uh, in Moravia, you'll see families going, going back and forth and places like that. And, and you saw here this Joseph Ausch who's in Ustek, which is a little tiny town near Theresienstadt, uh, that the family moves down into Prague. So it's one of the areas that we have to have to do more research on is this sort of back and forth. Uh, why, for example, does the Nachod family have the name Nachod? Does that mean they were originally from Nachod and came to Prague? Uh, Alexander Putik thinks that sometimes it meant that the family had some business connection to Nachod, right? Or maybe they were under the protection of of the prince who owned the prince the principality where Nachod was. Who knows? Uh, there are also separate families that may or may not be connected. There's an early Nachod family that appears in around 1600, and then mine uh, closer to 1700. Are they connected? Are they related? We're not quite sure. Uh, so there's there there seems to be a lot of back and forth, and sometimes you can see um, the family names developing. Uh, and I think the the You'll, you'll see them coming from Prague and be called the person from this town. And then that's, that develops into a surname that gets passed on then for hundreds of years afterwards. So I hope that answers his um, question. Randy, there is a, a Michaela Vidlakova. Oh, yeah. Like to say something, I, I'm sure you of know course. her. Of course, yeah. of course, of I, I wrote, course. I wrote some chat, but I would ask you first, if you could show me again the slide, with the Herschel, oh, with, in, with Dr. Herschel from Vienna. Right, Herschel with, Elias. I um, would print, print screen where, okay. Okay, because let me, I, I have let me a friend living not far from here who is a doctor, Cyril Herschel, and I would <laughs> like to show him. But uh, I wanted to ask you, are there more families in Prague that are related to you? Yeah, so so Na Nancy, hi, who's there? Hi, Nancy. I've never never even seen each other before. That's a, we. It's funny in this time of zooming where everybody is doing this. We've never done it, but we we communicate all the time. So Nancy and I have been going through the Prague family. She helps uh, transcribe for me from the Hebrew the cemetery lists, and I try to figure out the family trees. And all they're all related. So all these families have many connections because, of course, if you go back three hundred years you have a lot of ancestors, right? Mm -hmm. So I have dozens of different families that I'm descended from and they're all marrying each other, right? So, so everybody over time, it's, it's not so much um, separate families. Think of it like a rope that gets weaved together, right? So all the Prague families are related to each other in many, many different ways. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm gonna try to find, again, that, that PowerPoint slide. So, uh, with, which you can see that that was the uh, the one you from. You would have to share screen again. Yeah, yeah. I will. I will try to find it, and and maybe uh, while I'm doing that, someone can read the next question, so I can hear it while I'm sort of zipping through here. Mm, there is a question about um, Joseph Nachod. Is he related to Hans Nachod that was born in 1883 in Vienna and was a singer? Yeah. So Hans, Hans Hans Nachod is the is the uh, is. The, the, he's the cousin of my grandfather. So his um, his father and Paulina Nachod were brother and sister. Hans is the son of nah, Gabriel Heinrich, Heinrich, I think. Anyway, I have to look at it. But yes, Hans Nachod was a, a singer and a first cousin of my grandfather, Arnold Schoenberg. And he was the first uh, person to perform the Gore leader, uh, the, the, the role of Valdemar. Valdemar. Um, in the in the Gore leader. So <laughs> for those of you who know music. Uh, okay, okay there are share. many remarks here. That's fine. I, don't I can see try more to share. Questions. I'm going to try to share this screen again. So here's this Heschel Hafan. Is that what you were looking for? Yes. So this is from the book by uh, Bernard Wachstein, who mm -hmm. is uh, just an amazing uh, person who, who um, 
came actually from Galicia and studied uh, in Vienna and as a relatively older man, got his PhD in, in history and then worked for the Jewish community writing the history of the Jewish community in Vienna. And, uh, and he went through the entire old cemetery on the Zegasse. So thanks to him, uh, we have most of the stones that we can't find today or that are broken today. We have transcriptions of them. So he went through everything and figured out uh, who everybody okay, was. I already made the print screen, okay, so I yeah. copied and it already. Here, here, here he is again, this Herschel yes. Elias. So this is from, this is a transcription uh, of the, of that property book. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Thank you. There's okay. another question from Amila Kwantratna um, about her grandfather from Prague, Viktor Kohn, who was also a Viktor Kohn. Perhaps it was a more common name in the Jewish community. He was, um, as you may remember, a leader in the Jewish community in Prague and active at the Pinka Synagogue. Where can I find the appointment book and seat book of the synagogue? Ah, uh, that's a great question. It's I th think it's not online unless we have it from. It, it might be uh, in the National Library in Israel. They have uh, they have microfilms and scans of a lot of the things in the Jewish Museum of Prague. So you might be able to find it in Jerusalem in the National Library uh, on those microfilms, uh, or you have to contact the, the Jewish Museum uh, archive in Prague, and they have um, they have these seat books. It's there's there's also a a book that was published in the 1950s on the Pincus Synagogue that has a lot of information uh, in, about the Pincus Synagogue. So, and, and might have information on on whichever family you're talking about. But the, if if I understood, I didn't read the question, but it was about someone named Victor Cohn. Uh, Victor Cohn, yes. Yeah. So, so that's someone probably more recently in Prague and not necessarily um, further back. But, but, uh, or you. Or are you talking about? Let's see, my grandfather. Yeah, Victor. Oh, okay. The last so the question: question uh, whether the Cohn family is is uh, is a family that existed um, far back, or came, or or maybe came more recently into Prague. I'm not quite sure, so I'd have to look at that. But yeah, a Victor, like Victor, is is a name um, that you do commonly see in the 19th century. Are there any other questions that people would like to ask? You can. Either raise your hand uh, virtually or write on the chat. Uh, someone was talking about the Halfon family, Sephardic surname. Everybody says that every time I talk about it, but no, it isn't. Uh, it's it's a, uh, uh, I mean, there is a Halfon family in um, in Egypt uh, that, that comes out. This family uh, is the Halfon I'm talking about are in Italy uh, or older. There's also an old Halfon family in Metz. So it's a very old name. <clears throat> Whether all those families, the one that, that appears later in, in Cairo, uh, the one that uh, is in Italy and the one in Metz are all the same is really unknown. Mm -hmm. I don't know of any uh, actual tracing them back to Spain. And the name just means money changer, right, in, in Hebrew. So uh, it's the same as Vexler or Veschler that you would find in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, it's an occupational name, so it doesn't necessarily mean that the families are all related, but I would not consider it Sephardic. Actually, I had a big debate with, with Renata Segre about the Italian Jews and, and whether what flavor you would give them. And when you're talking about the 1500s, it's really, it's before this, this categorization that we have now, Ashkenaz, Sephardic, right? I mean, people were just sort of Jewish uh, in the 1300s and 1400s. Um, and it's it's unclear. I mean, Sephardic should mean coming out of Spain or maybe Portugal. Uh, and so, what do you, what do you classify these uh, French families like like the families living in the in the area where Rashi lived, uh, and afterwards or down into northern Italy like Piedmont, um, which is where some of some of my family comes from. That Eliahu Menachem Halfon in in Venice, his grandfather is. Uh, Joseph Colon Trabotto, who's known as the Maharik, he's a very the most important Talmudic rabbi of the 1400s, and he's in that northern Italian region. His family traces back um, into France. The Halfons, they say, trace back to Chambéry in in France. So, what are they? Are they Ashkenaz? Are they 
something else. Who knows? Um, I would not call them Sephardic, though. That's just me. So another well, yeah. question, let's see. Um, and another question is about uh, Italy has various communities. Yeah, so the communities that we know about in Italy, let's say in Venice, where it develops into a German community, a Sephardic community, an Italian community, uh, a Romaniot or, or uh, community, right? Um, those are all divisions that happened in the 1600s. So when you're talking about the 1500s, when, when this Halfon family and his father-in-law is a colonimus, talk about an old family name, uh, that's like Rashi's in-laws are colonimus also, right? So this is an old, old family that moves around all over the place uh, because of expulsions and economic opportunity. And they keep these family names. Uh, and it's just very hard to, to uh, categorize them in those times uh, as we do today. There, there weren't the same type of divisions. So the, the Halfon and Colonimus families come into Venice at the time of the founding of the ghetto in 1516 from Southern Italy, from Naples, from Apulia, uh, because the Inquisition was not just in Spain, but also in Southern Italy because the same emperor owned both Southern Italy and Spain. So the Jews were expelled also and had to flee from there. So these families were from Northern Italy. They came down into Southern Italy. Then they come back up to Northern Italy. Then one branch of my family moves up to Prague. I have a suspicion that, that there's a famous rabbi named Eliezer Ashkenazi, who is credited for forming the first Hevra Kadisha in Prague in 1562, 1564. Uh, and I suspect he may be actually a brother of, of Abba Marie Halfon. Um, he, he's a rabbi who was active in Cairo though, before uh, leaving Cairo and then coming to, to Italy and then up into Prague and then finally dying in Krakow. Uh, but I think he, he, he's also a descendant of the Maharik and his father is named Elia. And so I think his father could be this Elia Menachem Halfon, but, uh, but we're not quite sure. So the Jews at that time, especially these uh, maybe highly educated Jews, rabbis, doctors, astronomers, etc., were moving around quite a bit, I think, during those time periods. And, uh, and that's, that's how this branch came to Prague. So we have two more last questions. Sure. About the um, name of the, of the book of the Pinka Synagogue that was printed in 1950. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't have it on, on the top of my head. Maybe someone can write me. I, I can put my email in the in the chat. Uh, this, I think this will be a good solution. Is that a good? Um, for those, those of you who would like to ask any questions and... Um, it's it's, it's, it's hard to find the book, if I recall. It's not online anywhere. I have a copy of it somewhere. Uh, you had one more question, you said, Tammy? Um, yes, but I think they can also write it on, on the chat. Where can I find Prague documents online about time, uh, 1680 until 1730? So, right. So there's be a long answer, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean that's you saw a lot of the documents that we have there in different archives in Prague. So some are in the municipal archive, some are in the state archive, um, online at the Jewish Museum. They have uh, records. I didn't include. Uh, for this family, they're, they're, they've recently uploaded something called Berichtenbucher, which are sort of um, reporting books of, uh, you know, things that are going on in the Jewish community and, and marriages and lawsuits and things like that. There's also, uh, they have the books of the, the Beit Din in Prague, which I haven't uh, included in this yet. Uh, I need, to, need someone to help me go through those because they're obviously in, in Hebrew or Yiddish. Um, and they have an enormous number of books from the Beit Din. Those have been scanned by the National Library in Israel. So you can find them there or in the Jewish Museum in Prague in their archives. So there's just a lot, a lot of work to be done, uh, but we have the records. And I mean, for those of us who have ancestors from other parts of the world, it's really, uh, you can't compare, right? Researching in Hungary, let's say with uh, the Schoenberg family, uh, to researching these Nahuads in, in Prague. It's just a, a completely different thing. So I'm very, very happy that we're, we're able to do this in Prague. Uh, let me see if I have that, that Pinka Synagogue book. Uh, I forget her name. It's a woman. Uh, I've copied pages from it, but do I have the, the name of the book? No, I do not. 
Okay, that's fine. Okay, I think uh, I can write uh, an email. Yeah. So I'd like to thank you very, very much, Randy, for this fascinating lecture or talk. And oh, I have it. I found it. <laughs> I found it. Oh, good. Volavkova is her name. Uh, okay. Hanna Volavkova. Hanna Volavkova. Sorry to interrupt you. Okay, so that she wrote the book on the, on the Pinkus Synagogue. Sorry about that, Tammy. Anyway, thank you again. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're looking forward to the documentary film. And let us know when, when it's finished and we would uh, like to see it. Yes, yes. So, it should be done soon, I hope. I hope. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing it also. So, so thank you very much and thank, thank you.